land use bylaw set out in section 5.3 development agreements and amending the land use bylaw. In addition to the general criteria, the policy will review the vision and goals and objectives of the municipal planning strategy <clears throat> for the commercial recreation zone and designation to determine if the addition of the dwelling accessory, uh, sorry, the accessory dwelling to a golf course located within the commercial recreation zone um, is consistent with the planning framework established by council. So the commercial recreation P1 zone, council shall 2.7.11 establish the commercial recreation zone intended for areas within any designation that contain or are intended to contain commercial recreation facilities and uses, indoor recreation uses, and high impact recreation uses, and high impact recreation uses with predictable land use impacts, including but not limited to golf courses, campgrounds, gun ranges, or similar uses. Council shall, at 2.7.12, permit the commercial recreation zone, uh, P1 zone golf courses, campgrounds, and uses with a similar level of impact and complementary uses. So the land use bylaw text sets out the detailed regulations for each zone. Council recognizes that revisions may be necessary to respond to changing development issues and specific development proposals. Other uses within the commercial recreation zone, like campgrounds and not-for-profit camps, currently permit an accessory dwelling for the residents of the, of the owner or operator. This enables property owners to monitor the property when the premises is closed to the public. Um, the accessory use is not currently permitted on golf courses. The municipal planning strategy recognizes that the uses proposed for some zones are reasonable to permit throughout the municipality. Policy 3.0.32 states, Council shall permit the following zones within all designations, and C is commercial recreation zones. The application of the commercial recreation zone is enabled within all designations. Other uses within this zone, such as campgrounds and not-for-profits, as I stated, already permit this um, dwelling as an accessory for the owner or operator. As it is a similar use and may benefit from the presence of um, an outside, uh, sorry, as it's a similar use, it may benefit for the pre from having a, the presence of someone on site um, during uh, um, non-operating hours. It is staff's opinion that this is consistent to consider permitting a one unit dwelling for the owner or operator of the golf course as an accessory use. So the policy review for tourism and economic development. For economic development, the goal is to sustain the municipality's diverse economic base and encourage entrepreneurship and innovation. The economic development objective is to cultivate a resilient economy, supporting business development while maintaining environmental awareness. 2.5.11 states council shall permit a variety of opportunities for visitor oriented businesses in locations and at scales consistent with the intent of the zone enabled within the agricultural resource and shoreline designations as well as the historic hamlet of grand prey zone by enabling the text amendment to allow a one unit dwelling for a caretaker or operator of a golf course to be permitted throughout the municipality, we are promoting and supporting local business owners. They will be able to employ someone that will be able to provide security during non-operating hours, saving many golf course owners costs and damages and thefts. So um, for the policy review, where this application is for a text amendment, the general criteria have been assessed in a more general way with regard to the impacts <clears throat> resulting in, um, sorry, uh, regard to the impacts resulting in um, a general from the addition of an accessory dwelling to the golf course on properties. 
So we looked at the general criteria in a more general way for this one because it is a text amendment, so it would be applied across the five golf courses within the municipality. So after the review, at looking at the if the proposal is within keeping with the municipal planning strategy, um, there would be no financial impact on the municipality, feasibility of services, land use compatibility, drainage, excessive traffic hazards, and site suitability. Staff are of the opinion that this amendment will not generate any negative impacts. <coughs> So this is the land use bylaw text amendment process. So we are at the public hearing. Properties within 500 feet were notified of the public hearing and the public hearing was advertised in the local newspaper. Staff have not received any comments about this application at this time. A virtual public information meeting was held remotely in August 2021 and the video was placed on the planning application website for viewing. Okay, you ready for questions of clarification? Are there any questions of clarification from any member of council? I see none. I just want to note for the record that all members of council are present this evening uh, for the public hearing. Uh, so there being no questions of clarification of the presenter, are there any members of the public who wish to comment on the application? The applicant wishes to comment. Whenever you're ready, sir. Just uh, identify yourself for the, for the crowd. I'm Ward, owner of Eagle Crest Golf Course. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for taking the opportunity to look at this proposal. Uh, about um, 12 years ago, I had put an application for building on the same property, the same location, and it was granted I had the, uh, the paperwork, but you had to renew each year that you didn't build. I chose to drop that and assume that I could just build at any time. Come to find out I, I couldn't. So in talking with the county here in the planning department, they said that uh, golf courses were not under the category of building a residence. Um, campgrounds were, uh, just like to let you know that most small businesses usually have a residence at their site of business. Uh, farmers, different people, they oversee their property. Most recreational facilities don't because they're publicly owned and they're member owned, but being the difference here is that I'm privately owned. So that's why we would like to build a house on our property to keep an eye on it. And I don't know any if you own a business, you seem to be there 24 seven. You'd like to keep an eye on it. And it's a big investment. Uh, 29 years ago, we started uh, Eagle Crest Golf Course and we started as a nine hole golf course. And we had a few members and a few green fears. And uh, over those 29 years, we've grown to be, uh, we do 40,000 rounds of golf a year at Eagle Crest. Uh, we've grown, we've taken over the Greenwood Golf Course uh, at the base. We've maintained that with when they shut it down. Uh, we employ almost 40 employees. Uh, we have uh, over a $2 million revenue for the two golf courses now. Uh, I just think that um, building a house on a property to maintain a property safely so you don't have to have outside security would be a benefit to us and a lot of sleepless nights would be avoided because you know who's coming and who's going at all times, all year round. Anyway, I thank you for taking uh, your time to see, listen to this, and thank you. Well, if you wouldn't mind just staying uh, with sure. us, Mr. Ward, for a second, in case there are any questions of clarification on what you have had to say. No? Uh, just uh, for my peace of mind, you're aware that the, the, the text amendment that we're talking about uh, requires that either the owner or the operator of the golf course be resident in this property. Correct. Okay. Yes. I have two sons and I'm sure they can't wait to move in when I move out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Any other comments from the public arising from that? 
Hearing none, then that was very brief, and uh, thank you. And this is, this is the only one we have before us this evening, which is quite unusual in terms of uh, time, because we often spend two to three hours just at public hearings before we get to the point of having the council meeting. So thank you all for your attendance, and I'm going to declare the public hearing adjourned. Council will be called to order in one moment, and then we will be in the order of business uh, dealing with uh, this application by way of recommendation from planning advisory. When the clerk indicates we're ready, then we'll go ahead with other matters. So I will call the uh, meeting of Municipal Council of June 6, 2023 to order. And we'll begin with roll call, please. Uh, Councillor Armstrong is present because I'm looking at her. So that, <laughs> that means that all councillors are present. And we're moving on to item two of the agenda, which is a approval of the agenda. The agenda has been uh, circulated, and I can advise that it's been determined by staff that it's not yet appropriate to proceed with item 8E. So that item is being removed from the agenda for the purposes of our meeting this evening. And uh, so if someone would like to move approval of the agenda, on that basis, I would appreciate it. Move by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Allen. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. And again, for the purposes of the public and those listening on or watching online, it takes about 10 seconds uh, once we call for a vote for the, because it's an electronic vote for the vote to register. And if the deputy mayor was voting in favor or otherwise in favor. So that's unanimously approved. Thank you. And once an agenda is approved, uh, then of course we're certain as a council what items we're going to be considering this evening and any councillor who has, with respect to any item that's been approved on this agenda, uh, considers that they have a conflict of interest in debating uh, such a matter, they would declare it now. So I'll call for any disclosures of conflict of interest. I see none. That takes us to item four. We have before us the minutes of the meetings of May 2nd Council and May 16th Special Council. You've had an opportunity to, re to review those. I'd uh, entertain a motion for the purposes of expediency to approve both uh, sets of minutes. Moved uh, by Councillor Meisner, seconded by Councillor Granger. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. And that's unanimously approved. Thank you. That takes us to item five, which is business arising from the minutes. Is there any business that any councillor uh, wishes to raise with respect to the minutes of May 2nd? Seeing none, then with respect to the minutes of May 16th. I see none. Moving to item six, planning advisory committee recommendations. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, as uh, chair of the Planning Advisory Committee, will take us through those. Councillor Armstrong, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the first item that we have is that Municipal Council give final reading to a land use bylaw text amendment to permit the development of a one unit dw dwelling accessory to golf courses in the commercial recreation P1 zone, as described in Appendix C of the report dated April 17, 2023. I so move. Thank you. A seconder. Councillor Hurdle, discussion on the motion. 
Councillor Kellum. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I, uh, I just wanted to comment that I think this is a reasonable request, and I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise of the motion, please vote now. That's unanimously approved. Thank you. I see the applicant has already left. That's a sure sign of confidence. <laughs> Councillor Armstrong, if you'd take us through the next one. Thank you. That Municipal Council give initial consideration to and hold a public hearing regarding entering into a development agreement to permit a comprehensive neighborhood development at 1207 Belcher Street and associated properties PIDs 5503-0092, and 5503-7915, which is substantively the same, same for minor differences in form, as the draft set out in Appendix D of the report dated May 3rd, 2023. I so move. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Councillor Allen. Discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor or otherwise of the motion, please vote now. And that's unanimously approved. Thank you. Uh, we'll be going to a public hearing soon, Councillor. What's the date of the public hearing? It's on the agenda, I think, as being proposed as July the 4th at 6 p.m. Would that be correct? That sounds good. Okay, thank you. Bringing us then to item seven under administration, um, I think perhaps, am I going to the clerk for this one? Yes? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, Council. Uh, just a very brief uh, item uh, that we received a proclamation request from Operation Smile Canada um, to proclaim um, June the 18th, 2023, uh, to be the longest day of smiles in the municipality of the County of Kings. Uh, and I believe this is the second time that we've uh, proclaimed this day. And so the motion, uh, therefore, is that Municipal Council proclaim June 18th, 2023, to be the longest day of smiles in the municipality of the County of Kings. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, could I have a mover of the motion, please? Deputy Mayor, seconded by uh, Councillor Harding. I was trying to think of what the other name was that I called you, Councillor Harding, and when we were away, but I can't remember. Somebody told me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded that Municipal Council proclaim June the 18th, 2023 to be the longest day of smiles in the municipality of the County of Kings. All those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. That's unanimously passed, thank you. And item B is a request uh, for the renewal of the honorary crier appointment, something that we overlooked at the time that we uh, reappointed the piper uh, a few meetings ago. So we're rectifying that now. Uh, historically, we have used Mr. Lloyd Smith as the crier, uh, official crier for the municipality of the County of Kings. And it's proposed that uh, Municipal Council confirm the reappointment of Mr. Smith as honorary crier for the municipality of the County of Kings. Could I have a mover of the motion? Moved by Councillor Hurtle, uh, seconded by Councillor Killam. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise of the motion, please vote no. Thank you, that's unanimous.
I'm sorry, Deputy Mary, you, did you have your light on and I missed it? Well, I wasn't very quick about it, so it, could, it was probably me. Um, I did just want to note on the last item of business that um, Lloyd did an excellent job at the Apple Blossom opening ceremonies and at a number of different events uh, throughout the weekend where he was in attendance. And for the first time, um, there was another crier in attendance from Annapolis Royal who did her proclamation in French, um, as well as um, Ms. Whitman, uh, Lorraine Whitman from Gluescott First Nation was there and everyone was extraordinarily well represented and it was a really, it was a really nice event to see the, that cross population of language and culture all at the same time. So I'm happy to see Lloyd's reappointment and um, yeah, I just wanted to congratulate him on a great weekend. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, that's a uh, good context. That takes us then to uh, amendments to bylaw 108, alternative voting for 2023 special election, second reading. And uh, the motion would be, as proposed, that Municipal Council give second reading to amendments to bylaw 108, being the alternative voting bylaw of the municipality of the County of Kings, as attached to the June 6, 2020 three uh, council agenda. A mover the motion, Councillor Allen, a seconder, Councillor Harding. Uh, discussion on the motion. As you know, uh, and again for the public uh, listening, uh, this is a matter uh, whereby we are, are uh, carrying on a special election in that district and it's necessary that, uh, or certainly desirable, that we provide for alternative methods of voting. And they've all been explained to us by the various presenters, and uh, so that motion is under consideration for this reason. It needs to be given two readings. It was given first reading, and this is the second reading. Calling for the question, all those in favor or otherwise of the motion, please vote now. The motion is unanimously passed. That brings us to item D under paragraph seven, amendments to bylaw 93, private road maintenance charge bylaw. And Ms. Vicki Brook is here to present on this item for us. Ms. Brook, when you're ready. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I am here this evening to present amendments, recommended amendments to bylaw 93 being the municipality's private road maintenance charge bylaw. Though I am the one presenting this evening, I would like to acknowledge that this bylaw review has been a truly multidisciplinary effort between every department of the municipality. I don't think any department made it out unscathed. The private road maintenance charge bylaw is enabled by section 82 of the Municipal Government Act. In part, this section provides that a council may make a bylaw imposing or fixing payment of charges for improving and maintaining private roads under an agreement. The current bylaw was adopted in 2009 and requires that any private road association have an agreement uh, that be struck between them and the municipality for the levying of a charge um, which they use to maintain or upgrade their private roads. At present there are 14 uh, private road associations which are part of the bylaw and this bylaw generally works well without uh, challenge or issue. Because there are 14 associations taking part, this means the revenue team under the leadership of Mr. McKay works with any interested association to incorporate their desired charges as part of the bylaw. Since adoption, the bylaws schedule has been amended annually to reflect changes from associations to the rates and the area to which the rates apply. Beyond these yearly amendments, the municipality was approached last year by two private road associations seeking assistance uh, related to improving the conditions on two private bridges. In these cases, the cost for bridge replacement and remediation were significant, and the municipality understands these costs to exceed the present financial resources of the associations. And while we were approached by two associations, we do understand that they are in good company with others facing considerable expenses to repair, build, or maintain private roads. 
When staff began considering options for amending the bylaw, there were several considerations that were front of mind. First is that there were a variety of ownership structures and they changed from road to road. So in some cases, roads were privately owned, some jointly owned. Um, also was the municipality's legislative authority to manage or maintain private roads. And finally, any opportunities available to the municipality to issue loans, which unfortunately only applies to commissions and not to associations. So we couldn't issue a loan to a private road association. Ultimately, staff are recommending that council maintain the current approach of setting agreements with private road associations and to maintain uh, these, or to create, sorry, uh, certain amendments that will improve administration of the bylaw and provide a new opportunity to private road associations. On to the amendments that we are recommending today. So in section 3.2, we are recommending that spe highly specific revisions for a public meeting from the associations be removed in favor of the bylaw just requiring that a public meeting be held. Because associations to be part of the bylaw must be registered with joint stocks, their constating documents would speak to requirements for the chart, or requirements rather for the meeting held by the association. We're also proposing that the bylaw require a capital and or a maintenance budget to be required as part of the charge agreements. And this is now in section 4.4.3. We are recommending that a provision be added as section 4.2, which enables agreements for a term of up to five years, and this varies from the current year-to-year -year approach. This amendment we consider to be significant and important because it will ensure predictability in associations' revenues, and it is anticipated that this will increase the ability of an association uh, to access commercial loans. So instead of only knowing that they're guaranteed revenue for one year, they can now count on revenues for up to five years. And finally, we've added a section that explicitly enables the municipality to offer letters to associations that detail their funding arrangements. It's anticipated that these letters will also assist the associations in accessing commercial loans. As mentioned earlier, the bylaw has traditionally been amended annually to reflect changes from associations related to the rates they charge and the areas to which rates apply. Similarly, the revenue team has compiled a series of amendments proposed for rates and rate areas, which are before council today as Schedule A. The recommended motion is on the screen and I can take any questions of council. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. Um, any questions of clarification from Ms. Brooke? Again, for the purposes of the public, uh, Ms. Brooke, you and I might have a little exchange. This is this is uh, generally speaking uh, a matter that's related to access roads to lakes and cottages. Is that correct? Through you, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, it is yes. correct. Um, I, I can't recall the two associations that approached us, but generally we're dealing with a lot of private roads around lakes and uh, along in the, on, on the North Mountain along the shore. And this is a situation where the municipality is being requested by the persons that own that road and wish to access the properties adjacent to the road uh, to collect monies on their behalf and then remit back to them. It's not a tax from the municipality. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Okay. So the municipality does retain a 4% administration fee, and that's for our processing of the charges, the mail costs. But um, any associations that are party of the bylaw have approached the municipality and requested to be part of it. Okay, thank you. Any questions arising from my comments? Uh, seeing none, is someone prepared to move the motion that municipal council give first reading to amendments to bylaw? being the private road maintenance charge by law of the municipality of the County of Kings is attached to the June 6, 2023 council agenda. And I saw a hand, the deputy, and the deputy mayor moves the matter and Councillor Granger seconds it. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. That's unanimously passed. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. 
Moving to item eight, engineering and public works, lands and parks services. Fair number of items under this section eight. The first one being an update presentation regarding the regional sewer from Mr. Dondale. Mr. Dondale, uh, your light is on when you're ready, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. And thank you, Council, for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Aaron Dondale. I'm the manager of Public Works uh, for engineering within the Engineering and Public Works Department. So, um, just as an executive summary, I guess. I mean, my goal tonight in presenting these slides is to is twofold. Number one, it's just to give a refresher on what the regional sewer treatment collection system and, and treatment plant is, just for all of us to have a common understanding. Also, I'd like to communicate the current state of the treatment plant and some unforecasted work that's been required um, to mitigate the severity of the odor that we've been experiencing for the past several summers. Okay, so we'll start by just going over the collection system and the treatment plant itself in some detail. Following that, we'll talk about the odor problem that we've experienced the past few years and what we're doing about it. And then I'd like to give you an update on some future work that we have planned for the rest of the year. So the regional sewer treatment plant is owned and operated by the municipality of the County of Kings but it's managed and funded through a partnership. So that partnership is made up of ourselves, the municipality, as well as the town of Kentville and the village of Numinus and PepsiCo. So from an operational standpoint, funding contributions are, are shown to the right. So the county funds approximately 15% of the operational costs. Town of Kentville funds approximately 51% the village of Numinus 21% and PepsiCo 12%. Again, I just mentioned that that's for the operational budget. From a capital standpoint, those proportions are slightly different. Okay, so this is just a map showing the regional collection system. So the collection system is highlighted in green, and you can see that it runs from the far western edge of Colebrook to the far eastern edge of Greenwich. It encompasses a portion of North Kentville all the way to um, the newest development just south of New Minus, which is Canaan Heights. In total length, it's approximately 22 kilometers. <clears throat> Excuse me, it, it services approximately 20,000 residents within our county, as well as local industry. Mr. Dondell, I'm just going to interrupt you at this point to ask whether you're prepared to accept uh, questions as you go through your presentation or whether you prefer the questions to be left to the end. Uh, questions during are, are fine, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm, I'm sure everyone is pretty familiar with this, but questions may arise during your presentation and it would be timely to have them answered. Uh, okay, thank you. great. I should mention too, these slides are a, a summarized version of slides that we presented on May 11th in a community update in the village of New Minus office. That was about a three and a half hour meeting and so I promised Scott Conrad I would keep these condensed. So I'm gonna do my best to keep this under 90 minutes. So oh, it, it'll be quicker than that. Next slide. So this is a satellite image showing the plant itself. Um, a few things to kind of mention on this. So you, you, can see, uh, you can see there's five lagoons or cells as we sometimes call them. To the south of cell or lagoon number one, you can see two buildings. The building to the left is a blower building. It's full of um, large pumps that pump air to the ponds. And the building to the right is what we call a drum screen building. But all of the influent coming to the plant from the various communities enters the building to the right where it's filtered. Anything larger than six millimeters in size is filtered out of the wastewater so that that material no longer can enter the ponds. So from there, wastewater travels along where the cursor is moving, along the western edge of, of Lagoon 1, and enters the pond. If you look closely at that photo, you can see some white lines. Those lines are actually the aeration lines 
those aren't, if, if we were able to zoom into a higher resolution, you'd see that those aren't actual lines, they're circles of air bubbles. There's 500 aerators in cell one, and those 500 aerators are about five feet tall and three feet in diameter, and they're submerged under 10 feet of liquid. Um, cell one is approximately eight acres in size, just to give a sense of perspective for the size of the plant. The overall plant itself is approximately 50 acres in size. <clears throat> Something I'd like to point out too is along the perimeter of the ponds, you can see a road and just on the outer edge of that road is a fence. And so you can see that of the available landscape or the available real estate, it's pretty much taken up by ponds. There's not a lot of free space. So wastewater enters cell one, from there it travels to cell two and, and onward from cells three, four, and five. <coughs> Excuse me. When wastewater leaves cell five, it goes through an ultraviolet light um, system, which sterilizes any remaining bacteria or viruses in the water itself before it, le before it enters the Cornwallis River. So it takes approximately 30 to 90 days for wastewater to travel through the plant. <clears throat> Lagoon one, again, it's eight acres in size. There's approximately 10 feet of water in the, in the pond, and it holds about 26 million gallons. Another point to mention, wastewater leaving the plant has a lower solids content and organic content than the actual Cornwallis River itself. So the plant <clears throat> handles one and a half to six million gallons per day. On a nice dry day, it gets about a million and a half gallons of wastewater. On a wet day like today or yesterday, it's getting closer to six million gallons. The average organic load is 450 milligrams per liter. So when you take that volume of, of flow per day with that sort of organic load, it translates to about 22,000 pounds of organic material entering the plant every day. So that's a lot of organic material. This is actually one of the largest wastewater plants this side of Halifax. And as I'm sure everyone is aware, we've had an odor problem for the past several springs and summers. <clears throat> so what's causing the odor? So the plant itself was built in the mid to early 70s, and it was upgraded substantially 25 years ago in the mid 90s. So that means the newest equipment in the ponds is, is now a quarter century old. As you would expect, after a quarter century, we've developed some leaks and we're having age-related deterioration of the equipment. In addition to that, we have some clogged aerators. As you can see in the top photo, those should be, you can see of the three, there's two that are black and there's three that have white or gray residue accumulating on the, on the aerators. So that residue is inorganic material, such as wipes. And of just, course on, just on that issue, if I might uh, ask a question, the, uh, am I correct in understanding that, uh, that this material entered the system prior to you, you putting the uh, filtration that you mentioned at the front end into play? That's correct, yes. Okay, yeah. so, that, so that sort of accumulation shouldn't happen in the future because it will be caught at the front end? <laughs> correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. And, and I should clarify too, we've actually had a filtration system for several years. It was, a, it was a very fine filtration system. It was attempting to pull everything out smaller than about half a millimeter in size. And of course, with that sort of a volume and that sort of load trying to go through a mesh that fine, the system would go in overload, and it, it, was, it was going in overload about 20 times a day. So when it was working, it was working very effectively, but it wasn't working effectively overall. So by changing that to a coarser filtration, we're now able to run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and catch everything more systematically. So the second contributing factor to odor is sludge. So sludge is the remaining product that can't be organically processed by bacteria in the pond. It's, uh, it's made up typically of cellulose, cellular material that just doesn't decompose biologically very quickly. It also can contain some degree of grit or sand or silt. 
So as the, as the sludge accumulates, it limits the amount of water capacity available to process organic waste. It can also limit oxygen transfer, which leads to odor. So again, we have an odor issue. We've had it for several years. If we go to the next slide, what are we doing about it? Starting in 2019, we started planning what we thought would be a three-year upgrade to the plant. We took a year to consult with um, experts and to uh, draft RFPs and, and to select contractors. In 2020, we replaced the aeration in cells three to five. In 2021, in preparation to replace the aeration in cells one and two, we did a significant desludge operation. So we removed 6,000 metric ton of sludge from Lagoon 1, and we removed an additional 2,000 metric ton of sludge from Lagoon 2. So the expectation after removing that sort of volume of sludge would be a positive impact on odor. But of course, the following summer, we still had, we still had odor. So in 2022, we undertook some operational improvements. 2022 is when we made the upgrades to the filtration system. So we went from a fine mesh to a coarser mesh. It's not catching as much, but it's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week since we installed it. So we have better predictability on what's actually being caught and, and kept out of the ponds. In addition to that, we upgraded what we call a, a reseed pumping station on location. So we upgraded the pumps and we hooked up the station to SCADA so that we would have improved reliability. That reseed station serves to dilute the influent that's coming in from the communities to the pond. It also serves to increase the oxygen content in cell one, which again helps with odor. So in addition to that, we did a lot of work with experts. We had subject matter experts visit the plant and tour the plant with us. And, and we sought their feedback on, on how we should plan this summer's work. Following the consultations, we undertook the tendering process and contractor selection for this summer. Starting early this spring, uh, we've, we've been working since early this spring. One of the things we did was we moved the inlet in Lagoon 1. If you recall to the aerial photograph of the plant, the inlet was kind of midway in cell 1. We've moved that up to the northwest corner, which was a bit of a dead zone. And having a dead zone, we had sludge accumulating in that area. And with sludge accumulation came odor. So by moving that, inf that influent inflow pipe, we're now, we have a better flow regime where we'll have less sludge accumulation. We've also replaced the header system for lagoons one and two. The header is basically a large 24 inch pipe that runs along the length of the ponds to the, to the blower building and it provides air to the aeration system in the ponds. We've purchased new aeration equipment for cells one and two and it arrived on site the other week. In total, we have 800 aeration heads on site to put in the ponds at a cost of over a million dollars per pond. We also have contracts awarded for the removal of 6,800 cubic meters of sludge from cell two, and that work is currently underway. The contractor is approaching the 50% mark on that sludge removal. So before we go to the next slide, I, I would like people just to think um, rhetorically, if anybody's ever done a kitchen or a bathroom remodel, I would like you to um, just think back, did that go exactly as planned? If you had a plan, were you able to execute that plan? Or as you did the work, did you find things that were unexpected? And of course, unexpected surprises typically take time and they take money. So now imagine your kitchen or your bathroom is 50 years old and 50 acres in size. We found some surprises this summer. So if we go to the next slide, so in preparation to change the aeration in Lagoon 1, we were able to drain the pond, and it was the first time in many years the pond has actually been drained. So instead of having 10 feet of water, we had two and a half to three feet of water in the pond. And of course, when you get the water level that low, you can see things a lot easier than, than you can when you're looking under underwater. So what we found is we had significantly more sludge than we expected. We had in some areas about three and a half feet of sludge built up and accumulated. In other sections, we had about three feet. 
if we go to the next slide. I'll just I'm, show I'm a few sorry pictures. Sorry to again, but uh, remind me again to how how deep the ponds are when they're full. So when they're full, they're ten feet deep. Ten feet, and you had it drained to two feet. We had it drained okay. to a two and a half feet. Yeah. Thank you. This is just a picture from two summers ago. So when we say when we say we've desludged a pond, what that means is we're putting a boat or a barge in the pond and underneath that barge is something similar to a snowblower. So it's a very large auger that spins very quickly and as it spins you're sucking up sludge just like a snowblower would suck up snow. In this case we're, we, we have piping connected to the barge that runs to the shoreline. If we go to the next slide. So the auger picks up sludge and it pumps it to centrifuge machines. So a centrifuge works similar to a washing machine on a spin cycle. So it spins very, very quickly and dewaters the material. It keeps the solids inside a, a, a container and all of the liquid is, is very efficiently and rapidly removed, which then flows back to the pond. From these centrifuges, we have a conveyor belt. So the sludge, the processed sludge, would then go travel by conveyor to a dump truck the dump truck was then, um, it would, it would uh, transport the sludge from the location to a temporary staging area very close by where it was then loaded to 18 wheelers and shipped away for permanent disposal. And I suppose it's because I, I've heard your presentation before that I keep doing this to you. That's but, okay, uh, I appreciate it. Um, during the centrifuge process and the dewatering of the material, uh, is uh, what's the material that's left after it's dewatered smell like? What's the odor factor? That's, yes, that's a good question. So the the I, I think as we're all familiar, the sludge in the pond has an odor. Um, once it's dewatered, it smells more like a peat, like like an earthy peat that you would add to your garden. Um, it, it smells significantly different. So, okay. On this slide, this is a slide from just uh, about a month ago, and in the in the foreground of the picture, you can see the new header being installed. So, the blower building is in the back center of the photo, and again, this is a pipe that's running along the length of the ponds all the way back to that building. That pipe is about two feet in diameter, just to give a sense of scale. So at the top right of the photo, you can see Lagoon 1, or Cell 1. This is with the water drained to about the two and a half to three foot mark. You can also see the exposed aerators. They look pretty tiny in, the, in this photo, but those are about five feet tall and three feet in diameter. And again, inside this pond, there's 500 of those. You can see the edge of the clay the, the trenched and exposed clay, and you can see the water and the material in between the clay and, and the water is sludge. So that's the sludge that we need to remove. Next slide. So this is now standing on the southern, the southeast kind of corner of cell one, looking northward towards the Cornwallis River, which is behind us. This picture gives just a sense of, again, a bit of a sense of scale. Keep in mind those aerators are five feet tall. Um, you know, you can start just looking at that and understanding that the amount of sludge there can add up pretty quick and it, it can be quite a large volume. One of the reasons we need to remove it is you, you can see the black air lines. So all of the aerators are connected by, by plastic aeration tubing and that's it. And so there's 18 aerators, five feet tall each, on each of those lines. And, and to, to, tr to pull that much material through three feet of sludge, there's a very high likelihood that they're not going to come in one piece and stuff is going to break off. Each of these aerators are held in place by cement pads. And those cement pads have stainless steel support beams that are about two feet tall sticking up. Um, if, we, if we leave those cement pads in place when we attempt to remove this material, they'll be in place when we install a million dollars of new aerators, and there's a high likelihood that they're going to compromise the new equipment when we install it. So we really need to make a good effort to remove everything. 
I'm just checking my notes very quick here. I think I've covered everything there. Next slide. This is just traveling westward slightly, again, looking at cell one when it's, when it's partially drained. In the foreground, you can see some aerators that are clogged with uh, inorganic material, inorganic wipes, rags, hygiene products. If you look in the, in the back of the picture, you can see a plastic-lined, sand-filled pad. So that pad is was installed in preparation for the desludging we're doing right now in cell two. So two summers ago we used a centrifuge. This year we're using material called geotubes. So instead of pumping with a barge to a centrifuge machine that spins the water out really quickly, we're pumping it into the best analogy I have is, is pantyhose. So a, a very large tube of pantyhose and again all of the solid material stays in the pantyhose and the, and the water runs out. So these geotubes are approximately 40 feet wide and 100 feet long and when they're full they're six feet tall. So it's a big pantyhose. The, uh, the geotubes, once we are completed this work, that pad was constructed to hold 1500 metric tons of solids. So quite a bit of engineering actually goes into what looks like a pile of sand. If we go to the next slide, this is just a close-up of the sludge and the aerators. Uh, cell one has approximately three times the sludge of what we're removing right now from cell two. Um, we can only use geotubes if we have space to put geotubes. And again, if you think back to the aerial photograph of the plant, we don't really have a lot of real estate to put many more geotubes. So the work, the operation to remove sludge from cell one, we're, we're expecting that we're gonna have to use centrifuge technology again. And, and again, that's because we, don't, we simply don't have space to store additional geotubes. Next slide. So to the left of this photo, you can see a green pipe mostly submerged underwater. That's our new influent inlet in the top northwest corner of the pond. In front of that pipe you can see sludge and again by moving that pipe we expect that we'll no longer have a dead zone where sludge can accumulate in that back corner. That was moved again to mitigate odor. Next slide. So where do we go from here? So our next steps, the first thing we need to do is we need to remove sludge from Lagoon 1. We can't install the new aeration equipment until we remove the old aeration equipment. And we can't remove the old aeration equipment with the sludge in place. So this Thursday we have a sonar device that we're going to be putting in the water. And it's going to do what's called a bathymetric survey. And that bathymetric survey is going to measure the quantity of sludge in the pond. Our goal is to use that to inform an RFP and to release a tender as efficiently as we can and start desludging operations this fall. Item number two there, Lagoon 2 sludge removal. We're approaching 50% on that and we expect to be finished that operation by the end of the month. And, and, and again, items two, three, two and three are contracted work that that we've budgeted and, and planned for already. Once so, we've removed so the sludge... Excuse me again, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, when we... Uh, once you've desludged Lagoon 2 and go to work on Lagoon 1, uh, are, are we going to use Lagoon 2 as the primary? Is everything going to go directly to Lagoon 2 while we desludge Lagoon 1 is the question? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. So. Um, to, to perform the work on cell one, again, we're going to need to drain the pond one more time. And, and so for a period of maybe six weeks or so, cell one will be taken offline and pulled out of the process. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So once we finish desludging Lagoon 2, um, we're going to drain cell I two. Have one more question. Sorry, I apologize. You, no, it's no. I need to watch the red dots. It's dog. not you that should be apologizing, it's us. Uh, the deputy mayor has a question. 
Thank you. And um, I'm trying to sort through everything, so forgive me if this has been answered. But well, is there any new technology that when you replace the aerators, will have an easier time handling the inorganic stuff? Or is it just like stop flushing wipes? Is it like, you know, in, in lieu of being able to really control what people put down, is there anything in that, those new aerators that can handle that better? Fortunately, no. Okay. Um, the way the industry is dealing with inorganic material is filtration. Yeah. Okay. So we're, you know, most most plants, most larger plants in the world now have have had to install pretreatment in the form of a filter, and then of course you have dumpsters of material that you now need to process somehow too. But okay. to to that point, we have, as you said, you, we have introduced filtration at the front end that catches that inorganic material or yeah. a large part of it before yeah. it goes to the lagoon, right. and we did not have that at the time that we had all these items uh, clog our areas. That's right, yeah. Okay. So um, again, getting once we have the new aeration in place, it should, knock on wood, stay quite uh, inorganic wipe free okay. because we're not allowing them in the pond. Okay. And then my second question is, that's a great, and that's a great answer, thank you. Um, when you do the desludging, does that smell worse like does that create like an uh, that that six weeks that you just mentioned i think does that create six weeks of exacerbated smell or is it okay so um okay so uh, the fall it, it it won't be as bad in the fall because of the temperature first of all there's there's a, a lot of uh, factors that influence the intensity of the odor one is temperature um, another one is delta temperature. So as, as the temperature's climbing rapidly, you get a lot of striation in your water columns, which brings stuff up from the bottom. That doesn't happen to the same intensity in the fall. Um, the days are shorter, so you don't have as much photosynthesis happening with algae and mm -hmm. bugs. Um, so we expect the odor will be different in the fall, but there will still be odor. Okay. Um, the actual process of desludging doesn't generate too much odor, but when we drain the pond to pull the old aerators, and then when we fill the pond, we'll get a lot of the odor right now is because we've recently refilled cell one. Um, and so when we refill it, all that sludge that's sitting static gets turbulently churned up and, and active. And once it's active, it's releasing hydrogen sulfide and things like that. Okay, thank you. So again, we have all the equipment on site to change the aeration in Lagoon 2. Uh, so once we finish desludging, which should be the end of the month, we can move forward and get cell 2 in good shape. We have all of the equipment in place for Lagoon 1, but again, we can't install it until we desludge first. The goal would be to fully complete this work by the end of the calendar year so that the plant can have a couple months to reach a new stability so that we'll be ready for next spring. A fourth action that we're working right now is to receive and act on expert advice pertaining to long-term sludge management. So part of the reason we have odor is because we have a lot of sludge and so if we don't want to have odors, let's not have a lot of sludge going forward. So if we can work with experts and contractors to have a long-term sludge management practice in place, then, then we can actively be managing sludge on a, on a yearly or bi-yearly basis. That's also a practice that we'll be able to apply to all of our other community plants from Hans Border all the way to Greenwood. So a question that comes up a lot is, you know, what can we all do to help? Uh, again, inorganic wipes aren't going to make it to this pond anymore because of our filtration system, but we have seven other wastewater plants in the county that have the same challenges. So we ask everybody to be aware of what they're putting down their drains and down their toilets. Um, in simplest terms, if it's not coming from your body and it's not toilet paper, it shouldn't be entering your drains. 
you just go back to the picture again, so this is one of our dedicated employees. That picture is a lot more complicated than it looks. We have a lot of rescue and contingency equipment on the shore to make it safe for him to walk through an eight acre pond through three feet of sludge. That was an operation that we had to risk assess quite substantially. Um, but that's pretty much the only thing we can do to remove those aerators and keep them operational for the next few months. We do have a public website. If, uh, if folks are receiving calls and would like to direct the public, this is a website that we do update as, as operations continue. And we'll open it up to questions from there. Thank you, Mr. Dundell. Uh, other than the questions that we went through as we went through the, uh, as Mr. Dundell went through his presentation, are there any follow-ups? Uh, Councillor Killam? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just regarding the, uh, the, the uh, lagoon itself as it's located next to the Cornwallis River and with the climate change as we see happening and ocean oceans are rising and that is a tidal river what steps for the future regarding flooding for that all our lagoons basically i guess that so one that, in particular yeah yes yeah, so through you uh to councillor killam um in in this particular plant even though it's so close to the river it's it's less of an issue than other plants um, the top of the water in these lagoons is 30 feet above sea level. Mm. So that's, that's just with grading and, and with kind of artificial elevation as the plant was constructed. Um, we, do have, uh, we do have some more higher priority climate change related challenges in the collection system. So where, it, where seawater can actually enter manholes at extreme high tides. And once we, get, once we get saline water into a freshwater bacteria system, of course, it can negatively impact your bacteria pretty quickly. Um, so we have, we have some challenges in Hans Border, um, and we have some challenges in canning that we need to manage. I, I think those are kind of the highest priority climate-related issues. Uh, I was just thinking of the worst case scenario of a hurricane shoving at high, high water coming up through the the Bay of Fundy and into the Minus Basin up the rivers, how much damage it would do, I guess, for the yeah. systems. Um, one other question, uh, with respect to disposable wipes, uh, we discussed that at one time, I believe, uh, that the manufacturers were putting on their labels that they're disposable, and I don't know if, if anything further came out of that. I know that uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, you sent a letter regarding that uh, as to the costs. It's impacting our budgets for that. But I, I just wanted to mention that. One other thing before I forget, the gentleman that's uh, out in the lagoon, uh, do they wear masks when they do that? Or do, is that not necessary? So through you, Mr. Chair, it, it depends on the day. It depends on yeah. the temperature. Um, the one thing that we do wear, we have to wear every day is gas monitoring equipment. Um, and depending on the readings on the gas monitor determines what PPE we need to wear. Um, generally, the way we plan the operation is if we have any readings at all on the gas detection equipment, we won't go in the pond um, because it, it's, you know, from a safety yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I guess, uh, okay, and it. just on uh, Councillor Cohen's point about the wipes, we now we're catching them at the front end, but uh, it was a we were as as we're all municipalities very uh, concerned about the fact that manufacturers were calling these things uh, flushable when in fact they don't biodegrade, and uh, so we did our best to inform the public of that fact, and we continue, as you've just said, to inform the public that. If it's not coming from your body or it's not toilet paper, it should not go down the system. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Dondale. Uh, the perfume that's added to that plant, is that 24 hours a day in the minus? 
or just part of the day? So through you to uh, Councillor, Councillor Allen. Allen. We're actually not adding perfume yet. Oh. We're, not, we're not adding any perfume. We have a, we've, last week we had a deodorizer and a mister arrive. Um, we haven't had a chance to install it yet. It's severely undersized for an eight acre pond and a 50 acre plant. So we don't, we don't expect it's going to have a significant change in the odor, but it is an opportunity for us to beta test the system and the, and the product itself. So what we, what we intend to do is, um, is to install the equipment in localized areas where we can kind of really gauge how effective it's working. Um, but by design, the misting system, you know, on, on hot days where temperature is climbing rapidly, it would, it would run 24-7. Um, in the winter, it might not run at all for several months. So it, it really depends on the weather and, and the time of year for, for those systems. But there's, uh, there's perfumes, there's deodorizers. Uh, deodorizers are more effective but the safety data sheets also show that they're, they're, they're a lot more of a potent chemical. So that's something we need to risk assess also is, you know, putting, putting chemicals in the atmosphere for a long period of time. And at this time, I'd like to uh, publicly thank you and your staff for greatly improving the situation in Hans Border. It's rare if you can smell that now. So a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Bouquets. Uh, any other questions before Mr. Donadale departs? No, thank you, uh, Mr. Donadale, for your presentation. It was very informative. Thank you. Uh, so, a motion to receive Mr. Donadale's presentation, uh, moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Hurdle. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. That's unanimously approved, thank you. And we're going to item 8B, approval of a change order allocation, engineering services, regional wastewater treatment plant upgrades, and the CAO will be presenting on that. Mr. CAO, your light's on when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, thank you, Aaron, for the sort of context, because it's uh, somewhat necessary for this presentation. So um, I'm here this evening because of municipal policy or our procurement policy, which states that any change order to a contract, either individually or cumulatively, that's over $10,000 needs the approval of council. So this particular presentation deals with engineering services for the regional plant that we've been going through. The original scope of service is on the first slide here. We awarded the contract to Dillon Consulting for $46,264. It primarily related to the redesign of the aeration system in cell one and in cell two to manage the de-sludge and the design of, air, of the aeration system. So we're here this evening seeking change orders because of what was discovered earlier this year that Mr. Dondale went over with the excessive amount of sludge in cell one and the need to change from geotubes to a centrifuge operation. So we're seeking two approvals. Uh, as I just mentioned upon, and as Mr. Dondale went through in some detail, upon lowering a cell one, we discovered additional sludge and it prompted a change in the scope of project management and design services. So for an additional $159,114. Uh, design and management of cell one desludging, so we have to select a method and go to market for more bids. So Mr. Dondale mentioned at the back of cell one is an engineered pad that was to all geotubes that cannot, those geotubes cannot hold the volume of sludge that we now have. So we'll have to go probably back to uh, the 2021 method of a staging area. So using a centrifuge, um, a shuttle truck between the lagoon and the staging area and then loading on 18 wheelers. So there's a setup of a staging area which has its own membrane and uh, collection system, even if it's only in operation three to four weeks, uh, requires certain permitting and certain conditions. 
And because we've changed things, contractors have had to mobilize and demobilize and, and do things a bit out of order uh, as how they were originally contracted. So the consultant will be managing this reordered contract work already awarded, primarily uh, work related to, uh, to sell to. So uh, in numbers, you can see here that uh, there are um, three basic columns. So the current contract work, so amended to increase from $46,000, the bottom of that first left column is $67,185, excuse me. So with HST or non-recoverable HST, our total there is $70,000. So basically to finish up a, reorgan a reorganized approach of what we've already awarded through contracts is an incremental engineering cost of $70,000. To project manage and to come up with the design of the uh, perhaps the uh, the transfer station and other components uh, and the D sludge contract itself, we're anticipating additional engineering costs of eighty nine thousand dollars. So add all of those uh, current work and our proposed work that will be going to tender here in just a few weeks. We're anticipating an increase overall in a hundred to uh, to the effect of one hundred fifty nine thousand dollars. We're also here this evening to um, disclose to you that there was two change orders uh, that cumulatively came in at 19,554 uh, that have already been processed relative to Dillon Consulting uh, that are beyond what was in staff's um, purview to approve. So we're seeking retroactive approval of those. So we're making a commitment to you that going forward staff will seek prior council approval. So. This is sort of a summary of where we are with Dillon. So the original contract, as I mentioned a couple of times, the top right, 46,264. Change order number one that was issued, which was fine to be issued by staff because it was under $10,000, $8,343. And then we had a change order number two that got through our system and was awarded without coming back to council for 11,211. So that's the 19,554 that I just mentioned on the previous page. And then what we're proposing for change orders going forward to manage the updated contract is $159,000. So Dillon Consultant would go from an initial contract of $46,000 to approximately $205,000 with all of these proposed change orders. In terms of the financial implication, the incremental cost is shared among the project partners. Uh, Mr. Don Dale put up, I think it's his second or third slide, our pro rata share of uh, sharing of cost. Although that slide stated it was 15%, this is a capital project, so our capital share is actually higher. Our municipality share, so of the capital cost, is 21.7%. So our share would be $38,771, which is the 19,554 plus the new contract work of 159,114 times that capital percentage sharing of 21.7%. Any amount above the unused funds budgeted will be raised through long-term debt. So the work would be accounted for in GL 233-354-130, and that's the Regional Sewer Treatment Plant Aeration GL account. And we will be returning to Council once cell one bids have gone out, been received, have been reviewed by our engineering consultant and in-house engineers, and we'll come in with a reconciliation of the entire uh, project. So that'll come in as part of the cell one uh, desludging award process, as Mr. Don Dale has mentioned, uh, and as I've just gone through, that's the, that's the primary change driving the $159,000 uh, increase in engineering expense. So I have two recommendations here for your uh, consideration this evening. Um, they both uh, relate to procurement, so under section 17.3c of the policy and the related June 6th request for decision, uh, we're suggesting that Municipal Council authorize a change order to contract 2118 Regional Aeration Update in the amount of $159,114, including non-recoverable HST, and it would be to that GL account. And the second motion deals with the retroactive approvals that Municipal Council approved previously processed change orders to the same contract, totaling 19554 from that same GL in accordance with the related June 6, 2023 request for decision. I'm uh, happy to um, take any um, questions. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. Any questions arising from Mr. Conrad's presentation? It's pretty clear. Um, not a happy situation necessarily, but a necessary one. 
Then if we're ready, I'm looking for someone uh, to present the motion that pursuant to section 17.3 sub C of policy FIN 05006 procurement and the related June 6, 2023 request for decision that Municipal Council authorize a change order to contract 21-18 regional aeration update in the amount of $159,114, including non-recoverable HST, from GL 23-3-354-130, Regional STP Aeration. Do I have a mover of the motion? Moved by Councillor Harding, a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Granger. In discussion on the motion, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, I just, I'll, I'll be voting in favor of the motion. Just a uh, comment, wanted to say appreciated Mr. Dondell's characterization as a renovation. Um, it helps to contextualize the tangled web um, that seems to be the crooked road that this project has taken. Um, so I appreciate that analogy. It helps me wrap my brain a little bit around, um, around this discussion. And, you know, I also appreciate Mr. Conrad the commitment to the procurement policy and, the, and that type of thing and understanding that these things do happen sometimes and I have full confidence that they won't going forward. So I'm, I appreciate the thorough job that he focused in, in explaining it and uh, it's very complicated and so I appreciate you making it uh, easy to understand. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further discussion? Uh, I also will be voting in favor of the motion, and uh, my reasons are obviously the same as the deputy mayor's, uh, added to the fact that uh, the, the people who reside in the area of this plant have been uh, significantly impacted over the last uh, two or three summers, and we want to have that cease as soon as reasonably possible. and. Uh, whatever funds we have to commit to have that happen, in my opinion, we must commit. Uh, so that will be my reason for voting in favor. I see no other comments, so I'll call the question. All those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. It's unanimously passed, thank you. Can we see the second motion, please? The draft motion is that Municipal Council approve previously processed change orders to contract 21-18 regional aeration, I, I keep pronouncing that word aeration, it's aeration, update totaling $19,559, including non-rebated HST from GL 23-3-354-130 regional STP aeration, aeration in accordance with the related June 6, 2023 request for decision. Do I have a mover of the motion? Uh, moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise of the motion, please vote now. That's unanimously passed. I thank Council for their cooperation in that regard. And we're moving to item 8C, approval of change order allocation, Greenwood water production wells. <coughs> and Mr. Omar is here to present on that. Mr. Omar, when you're ready. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, uh, respected Councillor. Uh, for uh, this exchange order related to the engineering services for uh, the project uh, new production wells in uh, Greenwood, contract uh, 22-03. Second slide. Uh, and this is the first introduction for the change order to uh, the respected uh, municipal uh, council. And, uh, and this contract was awarded to uh, engineering service to CBCL in, uh, septem on September 23rd, 22, uh, with a contract value of uh, 72,755. 
Uh, the original scope was uh, to dump, uh, pump uh, uh, raw water to the current water treatment in uh, 1040 Meadowvale uh, Road in Greenwood. And uh, uh, the first change, this one, is related to uh, design new treatment facility at uh, the new uh, location for uh, the Greenwood uh, wells. And the second facility will provide a redundant and independent source of supply and the treatment apart from uh, the exist existing well field. And also this will uh, allow either well field to supply utility if the other uh, one is uh, unavailable. Uh, the value of the change order is uh, 42,262 uh, 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 dollar and uh, 94 cent, and this is uh, for uh, related to the design of this new uh, treatment facility. Uh, based on the uh, procurement policy, uh, any excess of 10% uh, of the original contract value. Uh, needs council approval. <clears throat> this uh, will be funded from uh, the capital approved budget 23-24-GL22-3-351-200 uh, uh, for uh, the production well design. Uh, the total budget approved is uh, 883,504 uh, dollar and committed to date, uh, the amount for uh, uh, is uh, 72,752. And uh, the recommendation uh, is uh, on the screen, and I am happy to uh, have questions. Thank you, sir. Just trying to get my own light on there. Are there any questions for clarification of the presenter? Councillor Kellum. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a question. Uh, does uh, this involve uh, our federal government, D&D, &D, in cost sharing at all? Or is this separate from, from uh, their PMQs and all the things they use water for? Greenwood, yeah. Greenwood uh, is not being supplied from this uh, system, is it? Uh, the, the, the CFB Greenwood? Yeah, like, uh, the, like the plan uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to you, Mr. Uh, uh, Councillor Kellum. Uh, there is another uh, plan uh, to, uh, like, uh, for the DND. This can be, uh, the, like, the water can be help, like, this uh, area and, uh, like, supply for uh, this area. And this is also the aim, the new treatment facility can be as well a uh, good source for water for the growth in green water. The one of them is like uh, the DND area uh, land, and uh, I think this uh, area is still uh, uh, under uh, like uh, negotiation, my understanding, with the municipality in terms of uh, uh, like uh, the development. So there's the capacity to join the systems, but it's not currently uh, being done. So there's a potential cost sharing there down the road, maybe? Well, there's a potential recovery. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of clarification? Seeing none, it's been recommended then uh, that we pass a motion that states that Municipal Council authorize a change order to contract 22-03 Engineering Services Greenwood Water Production Wells in the amount of $42,262.94, including non-recoverable HST, funded from GL 22-3-351-200 production wells pursuant to section 17.3 sub C of policy FIN 05006 procurement. Do I have a mover of the motion, please? Move. Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Meisner. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor or otherwise, please vote now.
That's uh, unanimously approved. Thank you. And Mr. Omer has not finished with us yet. He's coming back to talk to us about change orders uh, with respect to one of our favorite projects, the Elsford Lake Beach Washroom. When you're ready, sir. Uh, this uh, RFD is related to uh, change orders number uh, five and six for the uh, Ellis Ford Lake Beach Washroom uh, project contract 22-05. And uh, also uh, the reason for this RFD uh, to comply with the policy that uh, any exceed of uh, 50,000 of the contracted price be approved by the council. Uh, contract 22-05 was awarded to Rosco for construction in September uh, 6, 22, in the amount of uh, $930,000 uh, 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 and $839. Uh, uh, Briefest change orders from 1 through 4 have been approved to council. Uh, the first one, uh, change order number five, is related to supply and install uh, water line from the maintenance building to the new washroom building uh, of total value 11,854 uh, and 61 uh, cent. Uh, the second change order number six is for electric wiring for the automated uh, doors for the barrier-free uh, washrooms. Uh, we have two barrier-free washrooms uh, 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 need uh, electric wiring, and this is uh, change order number six related to that. Uh, the change order number five and the six total $13,728, and this will be funded from uh, uh, the capital budget approved 23-24. Uh, GL 21-3-371-115. After uh, we have uh, uh, in, uh, uh, presented in April 18 RFD, and uh, the, this RFD approved uh, back then with uh, 72,306 with contingency 50,000. And with the uh, new change order, this will leave uh, <clears throat> the contingency to uh, 24,015 uh, uh, dollars. Uh, this new expenditure of uh, this project, including the above uh, noted change order, uh, will put the project in total value one million twenty-six thousand and six hundred thirty-nine dollars. Uh, the value of uh, the change orders would be funded uh, from the capital budget with a total of $25,015 uh, uh, for uh, this project. Uh, the recommendation is on the screen and I am happy to take questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions of the presenter? Councillor Armstrong. Um, to say that this bothers me is an understatement. Um, how much was in the contracted price to install the water line in the first place? Uh, this water line actually is uh, new, and this comes from a change in terms of uh, water uh, like analysis tests done. And this leads to uh, getting a treatment unit at uh, the location. And the treatment unit will be in like the maintenance building, like, uh, and we have to get line from like the location of the uh, water, like the treated water, to uh, the washroom. So at some there's point, there's arsenic in the water. Understood. Yeah. But at some point, somewhere in this contract, to a brand new building, there was a water line that was to be run from somewhere. Yeah, we, okay. uh, for this one, yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, to you, Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, we get fund, like, uh, for the change in the design, we get, uh, like, uh, uh, in, in change order number four, we get fund back for that. 
So the, you've been given a credit by the general contractor yes. for yeah. the original amount. Yeah. So this is this is the amount less the chain less the credit. Yeah. Okay. I think that should have been part of your presentation. Um, and the two door changers or uh, door openers. I mean, when this building was uh, came before us originally, it was supposed to be barrier free. So I would assume that the original design had these door openers in it. Why didn't the electrical contractor include wiring these up? Uh, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to you, uh, Council Armstrong. Uh, the electric wiring or the door opener, automatic door opener, uh, we have to go back to the consultant on that because this is part, uh, uh, it wasn't in uh, like uh, the design and it uh, discovered that and now uh, we uh, adding like uh, this uh, 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 wiring for accessibility for uh, like the barrier free washroom, yeah. So the original contract did not have door openers even though it was supposed to be a barrier free building? Yeah. Right. Okie dokie, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Deputy Mayor. Actually, my question was on the door openers, and Councillor Armstrong asked it. So, okay, good. thank you. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, if uh, change order number five is not approved, does that mean this facility will not have running water? Correct. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, and, and we discovered after contract was awarded that the water has arsenic? Uh, yeah, I can uh, throw you, uh, Mr. Chair, to you, uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, uh, this, like, uh, after, like, through the, the construction stage, uh, like, the first uh, sampling of water, it was only arsenic and manganese, which, like, can be as a filtration. Another test during the construction done, where it like the test analysis uh, shows that there is kind of bacteria and they need UV uh, unit. Yeah, therefore a change in the treatment uh, system and also the location of the water. This leads to uh, the change order of new water line from uh, the new location for the treatment unit to uh, the washroom building. So, so I, apparently, Councillor, I misspoke. The, the, the issue wasn't arsenic; it was uh, it was bacteria. Uh, we oh. had already provided for the arsenic. Oh, okay. It was newly discovered that there was bacteria in the in the water. My question more was: in the original contract, there was provided a water line in the contract to be put in, or was it an oversight? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to you, uh, Councillor. The original one was inside, uh, but uh, the design due to like the uh, testing and it used the new parameters in the testing, it, it changes like two uh, new uh, requirements for new water line uh, from the location to the building. Okay, thank you. So there was provision, <coughs> but uh, it was being taken being supplied from a location it can no longer be supplied from. It has to be piped from another location. Any other questions arising from the presentation? Seeing, oh yes, Councillor Hurdle. With this uh, coming as the, I think it's the second change order or second set of votes as a change order, what opportunity do we have to completely back out of this project? <laughs> it's adding up. It's adding up way too much for my comfort. Uh, is there an ability to back out of this before uh, we're spending a million and a half dollars or two million dollars? Or I'm being a bit sarcastic, but uh, what is the opportunity to back out of this entirely before? I know this is not the exact recommendation, but. What's, what's the opportunity to back out of this? Thank you. Put another way, I think the councillor uh, might be asking also uh, what stages are we at in construction at the present time? 
through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to you, uh, Councillor Hertel. Uh, we now almost finish like the construction and uh, expected uh, to be by say uh, end of june or early july this will be uh, substantial completed thank you My apologies for the delay. We can only have so many lights on at one time. Councillor Harding. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, this is more of a statement uh, um, or a question I, I'm looking for is I hope at the end of the day that we're proceeded this long and, and it's gonna be good for that end of the valley and the beach and stuff, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to keep this open uh, more than three months a year that we could open it early in the spring and have it ready to fall for the walkers and the joggers and the people on the trails and the boaters that are around there the extra time you know to take full advantage of this building so that's what i'm hoping for thank you thank you councillor councillor kim uh, thank you mayor i i i'm having difficulty with this uh, cost of this facility can can, can we though uh, just uh, we are going to get into debate on the motion can we finish with questions of clarification uh, do you have okay. any questions about that? I can come back to you on on debate yeah no that's fine I just uh, have trouble with this go ahead understood uh, anything further by way of clarification no thank you sir uh, so the motion that's uh, presented to us for consideration is that Municipal Council authorize change orders to contract 2205 Aylesford Lake Beach Washroom Project, totaling 13,728.33, including non-recoverable HST, funded from GL 21-3-371-115, park facility upgrades pursuant to section 13, sorry, 17.3 sub C, of policy FIN 05006 procurement as recommended in the June 6, 2023 request for decision. Do I have a mover of the motion to get it on the table? Moved by Councillor Armstrong, seconded by Councillor Harding. Discussion. Debate. Councillor Meisner. I'm just sitting here holding steady um, to Manager Dondale's comment about construction and renovations and how sometimes things come up that maybe we didn't anticipate. Um, obviously, I don't really see a way that we can not move forward with this at this stage, but this is a pretty hard thing to swallow. I'll be voting in favor, but hopefully this is the last of the change orders that we have to make because um, this has been a pretty interesting project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll be voting in favor. Don't like it. Uh, really excited that it'll be over soon and that it'll be a great asset in our community, but um, our hands are pretty well tied. We can all vote against this because we don't like it, and then we're sit there with a bathroom that never gets finished and that we can't use so um, you know I'd encourage everybody to support it because we don't have a choice and uh, you know hopefully there were some lessons learned on the way this uh, ended up rolling out and also recognizing to Councillor Meisner's point there are things beyond our control but um, you know at the end of the day it is a positive thing um, for the beach and for the community and I totally agree with Councillor Harding that there should be a longer usage period uh, for that asset in our community. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Councilor Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I like most of the people at this table. I think everyone at this table um, is not happy about this. Um, I went back and looked at um, the uh, video from our April 18th special council when um, Mr. Quinn came to us with the first change order for the treatment system, and the mayor very specifically asked him if he anticipated any more change orders, and he said no. 
um, zero percent chance or less or a little bit less than zero percent chance that there would be any more change orders so the fact that something as basic as a water line um, is coming before us today for um, almost fourteen thousand um, dollars is incomprehensible to me and that yeah I want to go into specifics um, I agree with the mayor um, we don't have any choice Otherwise, we end up with a uh, $900,000 brick sitting Monument. on the edge of one of our tourist attractions. So um, we have to do something with it that extends the season for it. Um, I think that should be um, uppermost in staff's mind is making a way that we can use this for at least six months of the year instead of three. And I will be very begrudgingly voting for it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hurd. I really hate this. <laughs> I, I, I understood the need from, from the beginning of, of having a washroom and once we get so far in, I understood the need for the second change order and now the very precipice of having the washroom uh, how can I vote against a washroom that doesn't have water or a door that's accessible when it's an accessible building? Um, so I hate to say throwing good money after bad because I do feel this is a valuable project. I voted in support of it and I still think it's a valuable project. I hated the price from the beginning. I still continue to hate the price tag now. I don't get the accounting. But that's not um, that's not the decision today. So I will be voting in favor of this, and hopefully, uh, there's not another change order where we have sinks or mirrors or something that we had to have to add that is uh, very basic, like water uh, to a washroom. So uh, I will be voting in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Killam. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm wondering, do we have a number of how many people uh, actually visit that that beach in a, in a season? I doubt that we have that number in the room because we have no one here from recreation. No. But if someone does happen to have it, hmm. no, I'm getting... Just a thought. It's, it's very well used. I've been there. I, I, I think yeah. it's true. I just yeah. like to get an idea, but... I guess what has been said is what I was thinking too. We can't just give it up now as a $900,000 washroom and no water. So, but uh, boy, Thank having you. trouble with it. Thank Big you, Councillor. Price tag. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Meisner. Just through you to Councillor Killam, I do know um, in the summers past that all of the rental opportunities have been um, hard to come by because they have been um, at capacity and all programs have been filled beyond capacity um, in terms of paddling and swimming and special events. So it is a very um, sought after destination for local people as well as people that come from away. Um, I don't work in recreation, so I can't clarify numbers specifically, but I can attest to the fact that it is um, a summer destination for a lot of people. Thank you. Uh, and I can add to that, uh, to my comment, that I have been there fairly regularly for, mostly for uh, Canada Day celebrations. And it is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jewel of an asset. I'm, I'm departing from the comments on the washroom right now. It's a jewel of an asset. Uh, and and a, a great number of people in our county uh, visit that facility. And they actually uh, took uh, several bus loads of, uh, of uh, temporary foreign workers out there uh, to enjoy it this last summer. And the, clearly the washroom facilities were not adequate uh, to uh, accommodate people with handicaps. And um, 
That said, uh, I'll reiterate uh, everything that's been said. Uh, and I agree with what's been said. The, when the price for this particular project, and, and, and this has nothing to do with the presenter, I, Mr. Homer, I want you to be, I wanted to be clear that none of this conversation has to do with you. It has to do with the fact that then when this project came before us, the price, and it was a competitive process, the price that was brought before us was, was on the million dollar tipping point. And we sent it back. And then it came back to us a little less. And we begrudgingly swallowed it based on the suggestion that there wouldn't be any additional cost. And now we're, we're expressing extreme displeasure over $14,000, but that's not really what we're expressing displeasure over. We're expressing displeasure over the gross cost paying for a million dollar washroom. And, and uh, we'll be much more cautious, I believe, when we have that kind of a project come before us again in terms of uh, sharpening the end of our pencils. One more comment before we uh, call the question. Councillor Harding? Uh, just through you, Mr. Mayor, I just want uh, everybody to know that there was a NACOA grant with this that gives us a quite a bit of money towards this as well from the federal government. Uh, I'm not sure that amount uh, right offhand, but uh, um, I just want everybody to know that. Uh, thank you for that comment, and uh, you've uh, spurred Mr. Barr to uh, jump into the conversation. Mr. Barr? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, the ECOA grant was in the amount of $250,000 for, for this project. Thank you. So it only cost us $750,000. Yeah, that's, good, that's good to know. Councillor Armstrong, last, last one. Um, I, I, I just wanted to bring up something that was said to me by one of my... Um, constituents um, when he was I believe at one of the uh, community meetings there was a comment made about the fact that that this was sort of a jewel and it was costing jewelry money um, to put a washroom at a lake and there was a comment made that we got free money from the federal government towards the cost of it and he was very quick to point out that whether it be federal, provincial, or municipal money, all of our money comes from one pocket, and it's our pocket. It doesn't really matter who distributes it, it's still coming out of our pocket. Um, the federal government has a little more discretion, and maybe there's people, if you want to look at it from the point of view, that maybe somebody in BC is paying for part of our washroom at Aylesford Lake, you know, it's a little more watered down, but it's still only one pocket. So he did want to point that out, and I thought I'd bring that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I will send a note to my friends in BC thanking them for their contribution. <laughs> uh, I'll call the question now. All those in favor or otherwise of the motion, please vote now. That's uh, unanimously passed, and if there was a column that said begrudgingly, they would all be filled in. Uh, a break has been requested. I think it's in order. It's almost 8 o'clock, and we've been here since 6, uh, so I'll call a 15-minute recess, Mr. CAO, if that'll enable you time to prepare your presentation. We're recessed.
So, when we left off, we were about to hear from Mr. Conrad on item F. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So when you're ready, sir. So this presentation is about J-Class roads. I know you're well familiar with the topic, so I'm going to uh, go over the uh, too many butts and no glasses. So <laughs> I have to look at my screen and work this. So I'll be behind. I'll be confused for the 10 slides, I'm sure. Anyway, J-Class roads, as you know, are provincially owned subdivision scale roads, and they were identified, they were identified as on a specific list of roads that was compiled in 1996. Our municipality has 388 J-Class roads, or 135.15. The province and the municipality entered into cost-sharing agreement related to capital um, updates or upgrades, um, and this is the last year, I believe, in the current agreement. So again, this is just about J-Class, no other uh, type of road, and it is restricted to the 388 roads that are on a 1996 list. So the cost sharing agreement that we're presently in allows the municipality to submit up a list of up to 10 roads per year for capital upgrades for each year in the term. So I think at the very last meeting, our mayor um, suggested that it's, you know, a, a one of the 10 can be five kilometers and the second of the 10 can be 50, you know, uh, meters. So uh, it's just a list of 10. That's the criteria that they set out. Um, and that when we enter into these, there's a list that's approved by the minister and we cost share on a 50-50 basis. Also, the municipality maintains a list of all J-Class roads that are ranked by surface condition. You are familiar with that list. It's a colored list that's published and provided to council earlier this year, or actually last year, uh, November 15th to be exact. So we were in front of you on November 15th and at that time you approved the 2023 priority listing. On March 27th, we received confirmation from the Minister of uh, the Nova Scotia Department of Public Works that the department had approved 0.79 of a kilometer of J-Class roads for resurfacing. So after that uh, approval, uh, staff went out as we generally do from year to year after receiving notification just to see if something happened over the winter. So you approved a priority list in November. They go out and do a quick visual inspection to see if things have changed. So the 2023 or, and 24 fiscal year uh, approved listing, 0.79 of a kilometer, is Evangeline Drive from Trunk 1 to Cornwallis Crescent, Pine Street from Fales River Drive to uh, Orange Street, Prince Street, and Mosier Street. Um, and you can see that the total estimated cost is $430,000, and our share uh, without HST on it is $215,000. I mentioned a second ago that municipal staff go out between your November approval and the, uh, after receiving uh, the minister's approval each year and they do a quick visual inspection and the recommendation that is in front of you this evening is that Old French Road in Kingston, priority score 95, be substituted for Pine Tree Road in Greenwood. Uh, this is based on current surface conditions and their relative priority scores under the policy. The financial implications, there's a $470,000 uh, allotment in GL01223309 that was approved in the present year budget. Um, so it would come out of that GL. Uh, the total estimate that I had on a previous slide here that was approved is 430000 so we would take 215000 from that $470,000 budget. In terms of implementation, uh, the letter from the minister comes with a notice of acceptance. So with your approval here this evening, the mayor would execute that notice of acceptance and return it to the Department of Public Works. Uh, if you agree with the reprioritization, or perhaps a better way of describing it is substitution of those roads that I, uh, that one road that I just referenced, is then it would be up to myself or my delegate to negotiate with uh, Nova Scotia Public Works uh, to do that, French Road for Pine Street. Uh, Nova Scotia Public Works is responsible for contract administration and management. Nova Scotia Department of Public Works would seek municipality's direction if bid price is greater than 10% of the cost estimate come in. That has happened previously. You may recall us coming back for uh, amended motions in prior years. Nova Scotia Department of Public Works invoices the municipality after construction is complete and the final costs are confirmed and the manager of engineering is pri the primary contract with Nova Scotia Department of Public Works, so that would be Mr. Omar. 
So two recommendations here in, in, I guess, in the form of one motion, Madam Clerk, is that how we're doing these? Okay. So the first one is to authorize the mayor to sign the notice of acceptance from the Minister of Nova Scotia Department of Public Works as attached to the May 2nd, 2023 uh, request for decision um, for roads to be resurfaced for fiscal year. And I think that may be an oversight on my part. That's probably intended to say Ju June 6th. Number two is to authorize the CAO to negotiate with the Nova Scotia Department of Public Works to substitute Old French Road to be resurfaced in fiscal 23-24 per cost sharing agreement 2020-014. So I can try to take any questions you may have. Um, I'm sort of uh, doing a little pinch hitting here this evening, so geography and, and some of these roads, I may have to reach to some other staff here in the room to help me out. Or the councillor for the district. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. So, any uh, questions of the presenter? Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, removing Pine Street, uh, which was, um, according to this list, half a kilometer, um, and substituting Old French Road is, I believe, only part of that falls under the um, pre-1995 roads. So we're only doing a portion of that, I'm assuming. Yes. That is a detail that I would defer to you. It sounds like you have uh, checked the list. It's not all French Road. That we were. It's going... all old French Road, but I, I believe oh. that there was an. Ex at one time, it, it came into a cul-de-sac. I see. And then it extended after there, that. There, there's certainly a description of every one of these 388 roads and where they start and stop, and it's not uncommon for some not to be the entire length. But I have not looked at the li I have not looked at that specific road to see where it okay. starts and stops. But I so would take you at your good. word that it's a portion of it. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hurdle. Yes, uh, what was our total budget that we approved to be submitted um, prior to receiving this uh, proposal back? So our total budget was 470600 So we're getting less than half of that approved on our list, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. This is just an example of what you hear at every district meeting when we talk about J-Class roads, is, uh, is we, we budget usually much more money and submit many more roads, of course, than they approve because they're approving based upon their little uh, purse of 20 or $2 million that they distribute between 40 some municipalities based upon their submissions. So it depends on how many people are at the uh, feeding station. Uh, 0.76 is it just is, 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 I'll wait for debate. Um, uh, any other questions of clarification? No? So the recommendation, uh, the recommended motions are firstly uh, that uh, this council authorize the mayor to sign the notice of acceptance from the minister for the Nova Scotia Department of Public Works as attached to the May 2nd, 2023 request for decision for roads to be resurfaced in fiscal year 2023-2024 per cost-sharing agreement 2020-014. Do so I have a mover of the motion? Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Meisner. Any discussion on the motion? No discussion, all those in favor or otherwise, but before I call the question, is there some amendment that we need to hear about? No. Have we got the date right? I heard you mention June. She has it on the screen right now. Oh, it's June the 6th. As a tax to the June 6th, 2023 request for decision. So that, that's the way the motion reads. Uh, so I've got a mover and a seconder. That's just a typographical thing. Any further discussion on the motion? 
If not, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. Um, let me revisit, Madam Clerk. We had a mover and a seconder, didn't we? Yeah. I didn't get to debate the, with my debate, so I cut myself off now. The motion's unanimously passed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to financial services, item number nine. We're going to talk about Bylaw 99, tax exemption for nonprofit organizations. Uh, second reading uh, to repeal a motion. Mr. Mayor, I think there's a second motion. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a second motion. So we're back a slide. Uh, the second motion was to authorize the CAO to renegotiate with Nova Scotia Department of Public Works to substitute Old French Road to be resurfaced in fiscal 2023-2024 per the cost sharing agreement 2020-014. And of course, if we were to pass this motion, uh, then it, it's it's simply by way of authorization to negotiate. And if that negotiation uh, wasn't successful, then we would simply uh, default to the previous approval. So, do I have a mover of the uh, second suggested motion? Moved by Councillor Meisner, seconded by Councillor Armstrong. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. That's unanimously passed. Thank you. And that brings us to item 9A, Financial Services, Bylaw 99. Uh, we're dealing with a, a second reading, so we'll go right to that. Uh, it's been uh, proposed that Municipal Council give second reading to repeal Bylaw 99, being the tax exemption for nonprofit organizations bylaw of the Municipality of the County of Kings. And as you know, uh, this is a precursor to uh, putting something else in its place. So I have a mover of this motion, please. Moved by Councillor Harding, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. That's unanimously passed. Thank you. Going to item 9B, uh, tax exemption for nonprofit organizations adoption. Uh, it's been suggested that we pass the motion that Municipal Council adopt amendments to policy FIN 05026, tax exemption for nonprofit organizations with the inclusion of the flower card property, assessment uh, number 0091-8083 to Schedule A, and the exemption at a rate of 40% of all village-owned water utility properties effective April 1st, 2023 is set out in Schedule B. Do I have a move or the motion? Moved by Councillor Granger, seconded by Councillor Allen. Discussion? Debate? Anybody need any further explanation? Deputy Mayor? Um, we got a letter. And yes, I'm trying to. I'm trying really hard to summon it from my brain because I read the whole thing, and I'm trying to remember how this relates. So if you could, I don't see anything in our package regarding this particular, the second part of the the, the motion around the 40 percent. Would you mind giving us a brief synopsis? Uh, yes, I'm sure the CIO can jump in if I tell you anything that's incorrect. Um, we're reviewing the legislation, but it appears that we don't have the legislative, legislative authority to do precisely what's being asked of us, although there may well be a method by which we accomplish what's been requested of us. But it's, it's a very roundabout 
uh, process and it involves the village making decisions as well as the municipality. Did you have anything to add, uh, Mr. CAO? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, this relates back to uh, uh, a request for decision that Mr. McKay had presented, and it was to introduce some uniformity among the utilities. Um, so we don't have any suggestion not to approve that particular motion this evening. What the mayor is alluding to is we're, we're having a second look at the legislation. Um, I don't know if all of council, but uh, certainly the mayor and the CAO received a uh, letter from the uh, village chair in New Minas. So we're, we've, I've spent probably an hour and a half today looking at the Assessment Act and the Municipal Government Act and the different accounting manuals that need to be followed. So we could very well be circling back on this issue. Uh, so it's, it was um, only, I only saw it today. It might have been sent yesterday, but it was copied to all of council, as I recall. And uh, so it's simply the time frame's too short to have actually dealt with it or brought it before this council this evening. Uh, but as the CIO has said, we can circle back on this uh, after we pass the uh, recommended motion. Have I had a mover and seconder? Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote no. That's unanimously passed, thank you. Moving now to item 10, Committee of the Whole recommendations of May 16th, 2023. The motions, of course, were in your agenda package. The first had to do with the proclamation request for Pride Month 2023. Uh, and the motion, suggested motion on the screen is uh, a recommendation from Committee of the Whole that Municipal Council proclaim June 2023 Pride Month in the municipality of the County of Kings. Could I have a mover, Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Harding, discussion on the motion. No discussion, I can say that uh, Councillor Granger and I already attended a, a session related to this at the Glooscap Elementary School. Uh, was that, what, was that today or, y or yesterday? <laughs> I, I don't know, time just uh, disappears. Uh, in any event, it was a lovely uh, uh, session that they had in their, in their uh, gymnasium, and uh, we were happy to attend. Deputy Mayor? Yeah, just on that, add a little publicity to our own event, which I believe is June 17th at 6 p.m. here. Um, so we will have a committee of the whole, I think, probably before or that that same week maybe if I'm doing my maybe not no we won't have a committee of the whole before that it's the 15th gosh if I'm going to promote an event I probably should get the date right um so I would just encourage everyone to come out to that because it was such a wonderful event last year and I just hope we get lots of smiling faces in the audience because it's uh, a lot of fun it is the 15th it's the same day as the library Thanks for mentioning that, Deputy Mayor. I'll tell you, the problem is with really good events, it's hard to keep getting better. But we're, I, have a, I have faith that we can do it. Uh, so where are we with this? I've, I've, got, I've got a mover and seconder. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor or otherwise, please vote no. That's unanimously passed, thank you. And the second one has to do with National Indigenous History Month 2023. And it's been recommended by Committee of the Whole that Municipal Council proclaim June 2023 National Indigenous History Month in the municipality of the County of Kings. Could I have a mover the motion, please? Moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor, I'm, I'm looking for someone that hasn't done it a lot, uh, Councillor Kellum. Oh, I do. I do, but don't ask me in 20 minutes. Just ask me for adjournment. 
It's been moved and seconded. Any uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. I know that on all of these uh, these proclamations, uh, because they're important ones, that virtually every councillor wants to either move or second it, and it's so I I do actually look for people who haven't moved before. That's unanimously passed. Thank you. Going to item 11, board and committee reports. Are there any? Uh, there have been no written reports received. So are there any verbals, uh, Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. The Annapolis Valley Trails Coalition AGM is on Thursday, the 8th, at 1.30, and all are welcome to attend. Um, I will be there, um, but it's usually a, a really good event, and um, I did miss the last meeting, but I'll bring a report, a verbal report probably, <laughs> with my track record um, for after that a AGM. And then um, I would just add the library to the library board. Um, that as we go into negotiations with the province, we're gonna need to be, all of us are gonna need to be really strong advocates for the libraries. Um, there's, they're facing rising costs. Um, they have set formulas around funding and we are all gonna need to be really big champions to our provincial government to make sure that they're funded appropriately. So I'm just gonna drop that right now and I'll be knocking on all your doors to be, um, yeah, to be supporting the library system. In, the, in the, the months and years probably to come. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, for that. Uh, you probably need only refer to the president of our neighbors from the south in order to uh, have us all recognize how important libraries are for our children and our communities. Any other uh, oral reports? Councillor Harding. Yes, uh, I attended the Kings Regional Rehabilitation Center board meeting on the uh, May 29th. Uh, got there by the skin of my teeth from Toronto. Uh, anyway, uh, I was just got it to today, the minutes, and uh, it goes on for about seven pages, but uh, it was very interesting and we had enough for a quorum. So if anybody really wants to know Anything else, I can send you the copies. You can circulate the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports? Uh, since uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities meeting in Toronto was mentioned, uh, I'm happy to say that there was a very large representation. There were some... There were 1,500 voting delegates and uh, 2,500 people registered for that event, so you can appreciate the size of the facility that was necessary to accommodate them. It was a good program. Uh, further reports will come forward later because there was a lot involved, uh, but Nova Scotia had a, a serious representation there from all of our various councils. And uh, no reports from external boards and committees. Uh, so we're looking at a motion that Municipal Council receive the board and committee reports as provided verbally at the June 6, 2023 council meeting. And move for the motion, Councillor Meisner, seconder by wave of her fan, uh, Councillor Granger. Uh, any discussion on the motion, Councillor Hurdle? Oh, I, I was just going to add, um to, to your point at the FCM that uh, councillor from uh, the town of Kenfield, Paula Huntley, is now uh, representing Nova Scotia on the uh, Federation of uh, Canadian Municipalities uh, as a board member. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, a good re and she'll be a good representative for us all. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it's good to acknowledge it publicly here. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. That's unanimously passed, thank you. We have one item of correspondence under item 12. Uh, I'd like a motion to receive that correspondence, please. Moved by Councillor Meisner, seconded by Councillor Killam. Uh, any discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. While you're voting, I'll explain for the benefit of the public that we have received a letter um, uh, as, as is necessary by virtue of legislation uh, by way of notice to the municipality from uh, Andrew Robinson, president and responsible person in charge uh, for a numbered company, uh, 4440442 Nova Scotia Limited uh, regarding uh, the intention to produce cannabis, uh, which reads uh, essentially that on 2464 Ridge Road, Hortonville, uh, they will be uh, cultivating and producing dried cannabis, fresh cannabis, or cannabis plant seeds and the activities would also include uh, for the purpose of testing to obtain cannabis by altering its chemical or physical properties. The license will also allow for the sale of cannabis to authorized parties. This was a facility that was that pre-existed. Uh, uh, the same company that owned this facility also owned a facility in the Kentville Industrial Park. That company decided to close a number of its operations and and both of these were included in those closings and both properties came up for sale. This numbered company I just referred to who sent us the letter uh, has picked up the property on Ridge Road which already contains a uh, it contains two buildings and a fenced in growing area of uh, what Councillor Allen What's the fenced-in area? It's roughly About 85 acres. Uh, fenced, as one would see a DND facility fenced uh, with cameras uh, mounted and so on, and they're going to grow within that area uh, to begin with. Uh, but I understand that the land at presently is not cultivated, so I, one would doubt that they'll begin their growing season this year. It will probably be next year. So just for information, and the uh, motion's been unanimously passed. Is there any further business to come before the meeting? Oh, yes, look at the lights. Uh, I don't know in what order they went on, so I'll start from right to left, Councillor Meisner. Thank you. Um, I just want to give our condolences to those affected by the wildfires in our province. Um, I do have a letter, if you'll allow me to read it into the record, um, from a farm owner who has been affected by the Shelburne fire. Of course. Um, it is a letter that she is, um, an open letter regarding the evacuation of Shelburne County farms during the Barrington Lake wildfire. Um, we're very lucky in Kings County that we have Dan Stovall, who is an amazing resource in terms of emergency management and planning. Um, but I'd like to read this letter and just because there may be some things that we could consider or things that we haven't considered as these events are fairly new to our province. Um, so as many of you know, we had a wildfire disaster in our small community. It is the largest wildfire in Nova Scotia's history, destroying over 60,000 acres and still burning. That's not a title we want to wear. I write this letter to let the people who make decisions going forward what happened here. People first is always my motto and their safety is the priority and I don't want anyone taking away from what people need to address but I need to get this out of my headspace. I have sent this to all municipal units involved including the Mariners Center, the Department of Agriculture, the Nova Scotian Federation of Agriculture, the Exhibition Association of Nova Scotia and our local MLA. Stay safe my friends. To whom it may concern, I have here on my Cape Island farm large horses, sheep, laying hens and 80 three week old meat birds, which were to go to the other farm in Shelburne the week of the fire, which I was cut off from by the 103 closure. On that farm, we have swine, cattle and 48 week old meat birds on pasture. I sell what I am allowed to direct to the community by farm gate sales and at the farmer's markets. We, like so many other small farmers here, help feed this community. On day two of the Barrington Lake wildfire, I had taken in eight dairy cattle evacuated from 
village jail and put them into my daughter's riding ring on our Cape Island farm as a short-term measure. There was nowhere else with fencing and space capacity for them to go. When we got the order on day five to prepare our livestock for evacuation from the island, it was a task that required me to prepare to move over 100 livestock, as well as prepare my own family and help others. I write this simply to give you a snapshot of the situation we were all in. I have no regrets about helping, except I wish I could have done more and incurred less stress for others, which in turn would have been less stressful on their animals. Yarmouth and Barrington need to own their shortcomings when it comes to disaster preparedness and farms and their communities. There are a lot of people paid a lot of money to think about what if. I know, because I used to be one. I worked in government for 20 years and 13 of those were spent as senior management and healthcare, participating in real evacuations and simulated ones for long-term care. So what if? A wildfire strikes, part of Barrington Municipality, all of Cape Island are cut off from the 103 to Shelburne for seven days. What if all livestock from the evacuated areas move to Cape Island? What if we are then given on day five a preparedness order to remove all livestock off of Cape Island and from the municipality, which includes hundreds of large animals and poultry? What if trailering wasn't arranged? What if farms weren't available to house these animals? What if Yarmouth X wasn't available until day seven? What if other exhibitions in the province on day two was ready to receive animals except Yarmouth? What if no one was on the ground from government to help coordinate this and offer care for vet care and feed? What if by day eight, there was still no support or one person coordinating feed and hay for displaced livestock on the Yarmouth side of the disaster? What if poor cell service meant we couldn't even communicate by phone? What if we asked for help and didn't receive it? All of this happened. All of this is happening. All of it. The sad truth is, livestock have died in this fire. Some of our community's food supply, crops, feed, and breeding, anim breeding animals have been wiped out. Some farmers have lost their income. My heart grieves for the devastation in our farming community and just for our community in general. On the flip side of this, due to co this community and farmers' effort, a lot of livestock were able to be saved, and it was a monumental task, and our farming community will be better for it. But I cannot stress it has placed, I cannot tell you the stress it has placed on farm and livestock animal owners to have to coordinate these evacuations and prepare their own families as well, alone. In comparison, Shelburne X was immediately ready and had supports in place. I know this from talking to the president. I know this from speaking to farm owners, many of whom are reeling from the loss of livestock, income, as well as their homes. The takeaways. Yarmouth exhibition should have been on the list which was emailed out on day two to farms about where displaced animals could go. Did someone miss this or didn't think it was needed? I hear there was a problem between municipal units agreeing. Yarmouth is our nearest neighboring municipality with capacity. We were cut off from the 103 to the others. No one should have had to ask. They should have been on the list sent out to us on day two. The NSFA and the Department of Agriculture need to have someone on the ground to coordinate supports needed and to set up a registry to keep track of displaced animals when disaster strikes, not by telephone or email, an in-person command center. We had horrible service and com communication with Spotty. With this disaster, we needed one person in charge who could direct people and one person gathering information on displaced farms and livestock, someone who wasn't directly impacted and can focus on getting the help they needed. In Shelburne, that person was Jamie Matthews at the Shelburne X and Sarah Turner. We had no such person on the armor side. Farms need to be included in disaster preparedness within communities. I work in a career where those skills were necessary. I had fire preparedness plan in place. Many small farms do not have that capacity. The farming community here in Barrington and Yarmouth obviously counts on one another. Our priority as a community needs to be further fostering and strengthening those ties going forward. Everyone, I believe, does the best they can in these situations. However, it's important to discuss what went right and what went wrong. We have better supports in place. We have better supports in place should disaster strike again. I have no regrets about the help I was able to offer. However, I wish I hadn't had to watch people struggle with so much on top of a disaster that they were already dealing with. Sincerely, Jennifer Spencer, owner of Yellow Brick Road Farm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. That's a clarion call. It's no 
certainly from this table it's no criticism of any municipality that uh, had to cope with such an event, but it is a clarion call for all of us and municipalities across Nova Scotia about the number of items, the, the, the menu of items that needs to be in front of us in the event of such a, an occurrence in our area. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Councillor Killam. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I, I, uh, I had a letter that I wanted to read too, and it, it does connect with Councillor Meisner's uh, letter. It's a short one. Would you permit that? I, I would, but uh, if it contains anything by way of criticism of any person or place, no. I would, yeah, okay. No, it's it does just, not. It's okay. a request. And please go ahead. Um, it starts with uh, hello. I'm writing from North Mountain Animal Sanctuary. As you may remember, we are a registered charity in Burlington. We've now grown to house 100 rescued rabbits and farm animals in care. Our focus is small and medium-sized farm animals, sheep, goats, not horses or cows. In light of the recent wildfires, we are updating our emergency evacuations plan. We are interested to know whether the municipality of Kings would be able to offer a temporary relocation space, and if so, what municipal ground may be suitable. This would be in the event that a forest fire swept across the North Mountain. We look forward to hearing from you uh, Bass Leaf Vernis, uh, North Mountain Animal Sanctionary. Thank you, Councillor. I can uh, advise Council that I have replied to that letter uh, that, uh, uh, in effect, this municipality, other than the uh, small lots that it owns within subdivisions for parkland, doesn't own anywhere that uh, we could accommodate as much as we would like to. Uh, this request, uh, but I did refer the individual to other opportunities that might be available that I, I hope would be helpful to them. But thank you for reading that. Councillor Hurdle. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and, and thank the uh, firefighters from Kings County who've recently uh, participated in uh, helping uh, with the forest fire, as well as uh, we, I believe we had some municipal staff as well helping out uh, directly with that. So uh, just want to make sure that that is acknowledged and, and uh, our appreciation is shown. Thank you, Councillor Hurdle. Uh, I'm sure that we all are on board with that comment. Uh, I was I was taken by surprise on Sunday last as I was. Uh, in Wolfville, and I noticed uh, people coming out of Acadia University that uh, I wondered who they were. And it, regrettably, uh, on my part, I didn't realize who they were until I was starting to drive away, and they were professional firefighters that were being accommodated at Acadia, and uh, I didn't recognize that, and I, I wish I had taken had had seen and recognized what was happening so that I could have taken the opportunity to thank them for their presence in Nova Scotia. Uh, Councillor Kellum, one more time. Um, I just had one other item that I just wanted to, to bring forth. Um, I, got a re I received a call today from a, a, a couple that have waited a long time to build their home and they went to get their permit, which is allowed, however, to get a permit, I believe, and maybe Ms. Jabrak can, can uh, attest to this, that they have to have a driveway permit before a permit, oh, jeez, sorry, emergency, yeah. Um, a permit before they can go ahead with the actual construction of the house. Um, that's what I was told, and I just want, confirmation of whether this is going on. But this party called the DOT or people that make the approvals uh, from the province and they told them that they have no one to do the approvals now. And I'm just bringing that up in case there's other people that are planning to build and they can't get an approval for the driveway because they don't have a, an official to give them that permit. And I, I just wanted to throw that out there right now. I, I don't know what 
it's, I'm going to check it out a little more, but maybe maybe there's an answer here too. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if if it's uh, we won't surprise staff with the question at this point no, in time, no, since no. it's a provincial problem in any yeah. event. But but as with many provincial problems, it filters down to municipalities, doesn't it? And and the people who live in our municipalities. So we'll certainly follow up on it, Councillor. Thank you for bringing it forward. Anything else? I did. Uh, I did uh, make us uh, uh, send around a note regarding uh, the meetings that have taken place in um, in former Councillor Windsor's district, um, and I want to acknowledge that uh, Councillor Hurdle has now taken. Uh, Councillor Windsor's position as uh, as chair of the regional uh, sewer committee, uh, for which I thank him. Uh, the Mr. Don Dale gave a presentation uh, at a special meeting that was held in the community for the purpose of giving that presentation and an explanation uh, of what we had encountered and continue to encounter and uh, how soon we would be in a position to provide a solution. The people uh, understandably uh, um, are beyond concerned and, uh, and because they're the people that have to live amongst the odors that come from this facility and uh, one, I undertook to one gentleman that I would bring to council's attention that, uh, that they feel aggrieved and uh, are looking for some kind of consideration for their, uh, the fact that they're aggrieved. And uh, I would certainly, if if we don't have this problem solved, uh, uh, come the fall uh, for that community that uh, the next time uh, uh, our, uh, the, the agency with whom we contract for assessments comes down with as assessments for this area that we might consider looking hard at uh, whether or not a group appeal might be in order for those assessments. I, I, these folks don't we don't want them to have to live in this situation for any longer than is necessary for us to fix it. Um, I don't put the, uh, the blame for this at anybody's feet. Uh, many, many facilities across the province have been suffering the same fate, but uh, this particular facility happens to be located in a very uh, populated area and uh, it's not acceptable for these folks to uh, to not have their predicament recognized in, in a tangible fashion so stay tuned for that um, and that's my my comments for this evening I see no other lights on uh, there is no public here to comment uh, so I'm looking for a motion to adjourn Moved by Councillor Meisner, uh, seconded twice by Councillor Granger. Any discussion on the motion? If you're going to vote against, I want to hear your discussion. All those in favor or otherwise, please vote now. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, a lot of good work this evening. Um, and we'll see you the next time. We are adjourned.